ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Many people have asked me, is this cereal as good as I describe it? The answer is yes. They sent me four boxes. I absolutely crushed them. It is delightful. That is the word that I'm going to use. I always loved cereal when I was growing up. But as I got older and actually started paying attention to what I was shoveling in my face, you realize when you read the side of a cereal box, it can be a little bit startling. The amount of sugar in there is, well, depending on the brand or type, pretty much insane. So for me, for a long time, cereal was kind of out, but it's my favorite snack, and I love it when my kids bring cereal to the house because they never eat the whole box, and I would shove it in my face but then feel bad. But I found a solution for that because Magic Spoon, like I said, is delightful. Zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs in each serving. Cocoa, fruity, frosted, blueberry, comes in a variety pack. You can try it all, and it tastes amazing. It does sound like it's too good to be true. Everybody that I have given some to has enjoyed what it tastes like. It is awesome. Give it a try. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. Go to magicspoon.com slash cleared hot to grab a variety pack, and you can try it today. Probably not today if you're going to order it on the internet, but soon. And be sure to use the promo code cleared hot, all caps, all one word. At checkout, you're going to get free shipping. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. Magicspoon.com slash cleared hot and use the code cleared hot for free shipping. This episode is also brought to you by DoorDash, which in my opinion is at least an option and a solution for some people during the challenging times that pretty much everybody in the world is currently facing. In addition to what's going on in the world, people's lives get busy. Never-ending emails, to-do lists, you fill in the blank with what occupies the time in your day. Enter DoorDash, one less thing for you to worry about. Maybe you feel like Chinese food, but your kids want pizza. And then, of course, there's going to be a third person who wants something else. And that's okay, because there's something for everybody on DoorDash. One of the things I like about it the most is that you can continue supporting restaurants in your community. There are thousands of restaurants open for delivery on DoorDash. And these restaurants, they need your patronage now more than ever. Most people support their favorite restaurant by actually going to the restaurant. Well, guess what? We're living in a time right now where you can't always do that. We've counted on those restaurants to support us and our families. And now for them to stay in business, they are still counting on us. The dining room might be closed, but they are still open for delivery with DoorDash. DoorDash is the app that brings you food that you're craving right now, right to your door. Ordering is easy. You open the DoorDash app, choose what you want to eat, and your food will be left safely outside your door with the new contactless delivery drop-off setting. There are 300,000 partners in the U.S., Puerto Rico, Canada, and Australia. You can support your local go-tos or choose your favorite national restaurants like Chipotle, Wendy's, and the Cheesecake Factory. You, the listener, you can get $5 off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code Cleared Hot. All one word, all uppercase. That's $5 off and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code Cleared Hot. Don't forget, that's the code Cleared Hot for $5 off your first order with DoorDash. So go order something delicious and delightful. Enjoy. And that's it on the sponsors for this episode. My guest today, we actually had a uh, roundtable discussion, I would call it, but the guest was Henry Akins. And for those of you who are practitioners of jujitsu or fans of jujitsu, you're probably going to recognize his name because he is an extremely high level practitioner and coach. He started training Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in 1995 directly from Hickson Gracie. And he was actually the third black belt American black belt awarded from Hickson. And he talks about that, so I'll let him tell that tale. Spent a lot of time in the SoCal area learning, teaching, and has since moved away from there. But he hasn't stopped teaching or being a practitioner himself. He was here in Montana for a seminar 
that I actually only had the ability to watch as, instead of participate in, but it was awesome. I really like his style of teaching. I love his approach and his philosophy of what jujitsu is and what it is for. Joining us for the conversation, my jujitsu coach, Travis Davison, many time repeat guest, and his coach, John Frankel, also had him on the podcast a few times. So there was a shit ton of jujitsu knowledge. It's got to be, he'd been a black belt for 16 years. Uh, Travis and Frankel are probably at that, if not, a, you know, approaching two decades. So we're talking 45, nearly 50 years of jujitsu knowledge and experience as a black belt at this table, let alone what it took them to get to that level. Episode number 143 with Henry Aikens and crew. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute, give it to me, I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. What does jujitsu mean to you? What does jujitsu, um, what does jujitsu mean to me? You know, for me, jujitsu is, it's kind of like very, very high level problem solving. At the same time, it's understanding how to turn your body into a weapon. Um, I think all martial arts kind of teach that. So I think a big aspect of jujitsu is really how to use your body in the most efficient way possible to dominate another human being. And, um, yeah, I think jujitsu does a pretty good job of that. <laughs> I would agree. Is that what you were seeking when you first started? So, absolutely. And um, I or mean, did you actually know it at the time? Well, yes, but well, I didn't so, know it. So here's the crazy thing: <laughs> I, I, went, I went to high school in Oklahoma, and all of my all of my buddies were badass wrestlers. And so my main motivation for doing jujitsu was I needed to find a martial art where I could fuck up my friends, <laughs> where I could beat up my friends. It's like, these guys already got a head, huge head start on me. Yeah. They've been wrestling since they were four years old. You know, They've been wrestling cows since they were four years old. And so uh, I needed to find something to trump that. Um, and so I was always kind of in the search in the back of my head, like, okay, I need to find a martial art that is like ground-based or grappling. I, I, in Oklahoma, there's not much to do but drink and fight. If you, you know, go out drinking, it's a good night. You get in a fight, it's a great night. And so, um, I don't know if that's allowed in 2020 anymore. Are we still operating under those rules? I think they've changed cell phones. Slightly. I think cell phones have kind of changed everything. Right? I think the edges have been rounded Cameras a little bit on that uh, philosophy, but I support where you're coming from. So, and, and you know, it's just kids, right? Kids fighting, fighting in the park, like every, every week, Friday, there's a fight in the park. So, um, I, I recognized immediately how effective wrestling was as a, as a martial art. Um, it was always the wrestlers that were kind of the most feared. The wrestlers were the, the toughest dudes. And so that was kind of my thing is like, I, I recognize that. And I was always enamored with the martial arts. I am um, for me, you know, I, I kind of liked the, the idea of discipline and respect and all of those, um, all of those things that kind of tend to go with the martial arts. And so once I saw jujitsu, um, I saw, you know, my first experience of, of seeing jujitsu was this old grainy VHS tape called uh, Gracie in Action. So I don't know if you've ever seen those. Gracie I have in Action not. One Is it two. worth a Google? It's definitely worth it's a Google. It's probably free <laughs> now, too, on really? YouTube. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's so old. It's so old. But literally, it's, it's martial artists, different martial artists coming into the Gracie Academy and challenging them to fights. So it's like an early Gracie challenge? Gra yeah, it's okay. basically all of the early Gracie, the Gracie challenge matches. And um, that fight with Hickson and Zulu, that was kind of one of the most, that's kind of what a lot of people, uh, their first experience seeing Hickson fight was this fight with, he literally was fighting just this massive, you know, gorilla like built like a gorilla silverback gorilla like zulu um and hickson ended up choking him out but um yeah it was all the old challenge matches um and you know they were literally just toying with guys and hori and gracie is there narrating the the video and th his narration on it is just amazing because it's like <laughs> and now watch the lion take down the feeble gazelle and sink his teeth in and you know he's like so the only way it could be better is if it was like james earl jones saying yeah, exactly ex those same things exactly yeah 
<laughs> Darth Vader. I don't know if I've ever asked this. Is wrestling a martial art? Is it considered a martial art? You know, it's it's considered a sport, right? But it I is, can see like it, how it could totally be considered a martial art. It's a it's it's originally the I think the the history of it, pancration, right, was a martial art. It was a combat art, and then with rules putting it being put into place, it eventually becomes like, hey, we we compete in a sport aspect. But I mean, think about it. With wrestling, it's how do you dominate another human being? How do you take a guy, throw him on the ground, and put him on his back, which is, you know, for considered for most people a, a pretty helpless position? Interesting. Wasn't Pancration nude though? Uh, I'm not sure if it was nude <laughs> That's gay. or That's gay as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> the Greek. <laughs> no eye contact though. No eye contact. They're gonna get really drunk, and then didn't they have those pits that they would just vomit into afterwards? Correct. I think there was a lot of olive oil involved as well. I'm not. I guess I'm not. I mean, I'm going to judge it on the inside. I'll reserve my commentary. <laughs> I saw. I, I saw a statue. Someone's a, a picture of a statue where there's two never, naked guys wrestling, I know this and one guy's going. upside down. Yeah, I put that on a the glass hole. It's yeah, a yeah. He's got hidden a, uh, Navy SEAL fighting yeah. technique. A, a little yeah. crotch grab in there. Throw it a little just, crotch grab. Just he barely, barely grabbed. It was a Western it. tuck. It was inverted. So thumb down. It's. I mean, that's as John. You know, when Special John's teachings. Teaching, thumb. Oh, thumb down on that grip, right? <laughs> Yeah. John doesn't teach that teach that particular technique, yeah. but I'm just saying if you're inverted like that, it's adaptable. It is. So, what was your impetus to leave Oklahoma? If you would have given me a map of the U.S. Mm -hmm. and 50 chances to name a state that you were from, I probably still would have skipped Oklahoma, knowing that you're like, well, because I have heard you from like SoCal, the SoCal area. I would yeah. have just assumed that that's where you were from. So, what was the impetus to go Oklahoma? Which it's known for its massive mountains and you know landscape. To so much to do, too. <laughs> so much to do. To where'd you first land when you left Oklahoma? Uh, L.A. Okay. Yeah. So, well, what my originally when my parents came over here, um, we were, we lived on the East Coast, and then my mom moved to Oklahoma. Um, so because it was just the cost of living was so inexpensive, and at the time uh, I had an uncle there, so I went to high school in Oklahoma. I originally was living in Washington, D.C., back and forth between Washington, D.C. and New York, but landed in Oklahoma. That's where um, I kind of saw, you know, wrestling is huge in Oklahoma. Like Oklahoma State University, John Smith is the head coach there, and he's yes. like the Olympic coach and, you know, one of the considered one of the greatest American wrestlers of all time. Um, so that's what kind of introduced me to like, wow, okay, wrestling. That's, I need to find something that can you know, deal with wrestlers, compete with wrestling. Did you go to LA just in that search? So, yeah. I, I, I was going to say, because if you didn't, you were the luckiest son of a bitch on the face of the earth. If that wasn't well, intentional. I, <laughs> I literally went to, so I, spring break, I went out to LA in search of Hickson because I already heard he's the best. Um, and this was after the first UFC and Hoist had mentioned in a magazine, I think he said, you know, if you guys think I'm good, you should see my brother Hickson. He's 10 times better than me. So, and the, in, in the Gracie in action, they had mentioned that Hickson is the best of all the brothers. The lion. Yeah. Taking so, down the gazelle. So I'm like, <laughs> well, I want to go train with the best. I want to see what, of you course. know, what this is all it's about. A rational thought process in my mind. So, what year um, is this though? This was 94. Okay. 94. So the first UFC was 93. Uh, this was 94. I went out, um, I think spring break or, um, or maybe it was Thanksgiving break. Um, found Hickson's gym miracle that I found it because back then it was yellow pages and they didn't have anything in the yellow pages. And literally, uh, I was staying with my aunt who was in Beverly Hills and she had a personal trainer who had a friend that trained at Hickson's. <laughs> well, here's the crazy thing. We called the Gracie Academy, right? Looking for Hickson. And when we called the Gracie Academy, there, you know, there was a big falling out between the brothers. Um, everyone ended up leaving, uh, the Gracie Academy. So, um, when we called the Gracie Academy looking for Hickson, the secretary there said, oh, we don't know anybody named Hickson. So I was like, shit. Power move. <laughs> yeah. So I was like. But if you're looking for jujitsu, you know, just come on over. We can meet you at nine o'clock. Exactly. Full power move. I like it. <laughs> so by, by chance, the first two days, we finally end up tracking down where his school was. And if you've ever seen that documentary, Choke, it's yes. like, it was like impossible to find it. It's in this old 
like warehouse behind a carpet store and next to like an old paint body shop. So, I love every part of the story so far. And it was <laughs> it was it was actually a karate studio that they used most of the time. The karate studio was there like a couple nights a week. So end up finding it old, dingy, really dingy. It looked like an old boxing gym. Um, walk in there. And my first experience, I walk in there and literally within five minutes, someone's passed out, choked out, unconscious on the mats. And they're lifting his legs up, <laughs> shaking his legs. And right away, it, I went in there with a buddy of mine. So me and my buddy came out for spring break. We looked at each other and I'm like, we're in the right place. <laughs> Holy shit. And you just, what'd you do? Did you meet him that day? You so, took a class that yeah, day? Yeah, we, we just started taking classes. Um, I didn't, I think the second night I met him, he came in in the evening and uh, got to meet him and say hi. But the first week I was there, you know, I was, I was considered myself a, a tough kid. Liked to work out. I was doing martial arts at the time too. I was doing Taekwondo um, and had done a little bit of Thai boxing. Um, and literally, I think it's like a lot of people's first experience doing jujitsu. Um, I started training and I got completely dominated. I felt helpless. And does anybody not have that experience on we day one? Talk, we were just talking about that yeah. last night, right? And yeah. even no, wrestlers, I, like they're squirrely, but if you can get them on their back, they it they're or like, close guard or there's a yeah. lot of positions where yeah. Well, yeah, I, and I think that's the thing with a wrestler. I mean, there's you know, there, I think in wrestling, there's few, very few wrestlers know any techniques where they can make you submit. They can pin you, they can put you on your back, but well, don't they lose you, if they submit you? I mean, if you sub, try you to could submit, get somebody, DQ'd for. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, just going in there and training and feeling completely helpless against guys half my size, you know, getting tossed around and played. Um, so <laughs> right after that, I said, you know what, I need to learn this. Like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to be able to learn this because I never want to feel this helpless again. Um, and so after that week, I went home, started making plans to uh, move. I said, Mom, I'm moving to California and six months later I was in LA hell yes yeah. did you read Hickson into any of these plans or did you just show up and no attend? I just showed up <laughs> yeah I'm like, that's the I'm, best I'm, way to go I'm right? like I'm here and uh good luck getting rid of me so I was actually it, it was actually pretty awesome because I had no distractions you know I didn't have any friends I didn't know anyone I didn't know my way around this massive massive town coming from you know Oklahoma City which is a small small town people wise um, I didn't have any distractions and so my focus was just to train Jiu Jitsu and get as good as I could get and so I end up coming and I would literally show up in the morning at 7 o'clock in the morning and a lot of nights I wouldn't leave till 7 or 9 at night so I was there all the time and after the first few weeks they're like dude you're here all the time why don't you just be the secretary and answer the phone for us <laughs> so I end up getting a job uh, as the secretary after yes. a couple weeks that's the best job application there is anyway. Just show people what you're capable of instead of sliding them a little dossier that says this is who I am. Yeah. Well, I'm like, I'm here all the time anyways. I might as well help out. And then, yeah. How much were you training? And you're describing a 12-hour day. How much of that time was spent on the mats? So anywhere from five to six classes a day. Would you consider that too much for most people? Maybe even in the beginning too, like just that bolus of information, too much to process? You know, I, I think every individual is so unique, right? In, in how much you're willing to absorb. I mean, I just immersed myself in it. Yeah. And I, for me, I felt that's what better way to learn than just to completely immerse yourself in it. And you were in your um, early 20s? 19. Ni yeah, okay. Well, 19 you were in the phys sponge. Physically, he could handle it. Physically, he could handle it. And your life experiences up until that point were, I'm not to say it negatively, they weren't, they were just low. And now you're starting right. to fill that bucket with, a, yeah, you were the perfect. Yeah. time to receive that information yeah and it was awesome so um you know hickson would come in every day he had a two-hour class in the afternoon that was his kind of there was a seven o'clock class an eight o'clock class and then there was a break until the afternoon and hickson would teach a two-hour class in the afternoon um and then there was a couple of evening classes so i i mean i was getting to train with him almost every single day you know back in the early days it was just insane and then you know getting to see all the guys from brazil all these other guys coming in uh, fabio santos used to bring jocko up jocko and dean lister up from san diego i've heard know. they're a very like soft easy sensitive role is how i've heard it described 
It's oh like yeah, rolling very... with silk wrapped in <laughs> velvet. Very very soft. I actually haven't rolled with Jocko. No. And I don't ever okay. want to actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never. I you know I don't know. I can't remember if I uh, had rolled with Jocko, but me and Dean because we were the same weight and we were both blue belts at the same time so uh dean we, was smaller back then he was, had some he, he was, was 173 so yeah, he yeah. used to compete 173 that was we were both kind of in the same weight for a brief period of time um and uh yeah we had some we had some battles some fun some fun roles <sighs> this is i think the only thing i miss about socal now is i didn't re i had no idea i lived there for so oh, long the mecca of jujitsu i had no idea yeah. i lived there for so <clears throat> long out in east lake like da -dee -da -dee -da. i probably was driving by 40 Jiu-jitsu play, but I wouldn't have gone anyway because the guys at work were like, "Man, jiu-jitsu." I'm like, "You're gay." Yeah. Like, I'm not gonna do what you think is cool because that makes me not cool. <laughs> well, he's like San Diego, right? Yeah. Yeah, and so San Diego a few years ago pretty much became like the mecca yeah. of jiu-jitsu. It started off in the South Bay. Yeah. You know, uh, of LA, that's where the Gracies and the Machados and all those guys first landed, um, and then it kind of just spread from there, and then eventually, like all the Brazilians just. You know they're so accustomed to that type of climate and then the surfing and then the kind yeah. of relaxed atmosphere um man so many guys end up moving up to san diego and starting schools in san diego it's i forget who it was recently but and i'm paraphrasing the comment but it was essentially if you're good enough to make money teaching jujitsu you are going to leave brazil and come to the u.s and probably do it just yeah. because of the economics right yeah and that's i think you know hickson went back to brazil for a couple years um and just was not making it. I mean, even Hickson, you yeah. know, he was not able to make it. There's just no money. There's no opportunity there. Um, and so he came back to the United States. He, you know, when he originally went back to Brazil, his intention was to stay there and, and build a good life. And uh, I just didn't think, uh, don't think it was possible even for him. Is his name massive there? I have zero experience with Brazil whatsoever. I would assume that yeah. it is, but I mean, He's I don't know. I've never been like a super celebrity. Okay. Because there's, I mean, if you, depending on, there's people in LA that you would think are super celebrity. Mm -hmm. If you go to New York, they're like, who the fuck is this guy? Right. So I didn't, I didn't know how many borders that it actually yeah. transcended. They're, I think their family is, the Gracie is name. very, very famous in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Wow. And he came back. Oh, but that the other <laughs> issue for even really famous people who theoretically could be like independently wealthy or make a living down there. Once they get a little bit older and they have a family, it's super dangerous down there. And like they might feel comfortable, but they don't want their kids yeah. down there. They don't want their wives down there. It's like public safety is not good. Yeah, and that's I, I think that's one of the problems with even even if you do make it and you do become wealthy, your you might be your, more of a target. The risk now. level yeah. Yeah. is uh, you know yeah. now you're you've just put yourself in a in a you know a target. You just put a target on your back. What was the mat culture like when you were learning? Man. So when we first started training, I mean, A, it, it was a really different environment. A, I don't think people really understood how to train. The training methodologies have advanced so much and just being smart in, in nutrition. And you see that in all sports over time, yeah. right? Like people just become smarter in understanding how to train, how to train effectively. Literally, we would just go to war every day. It was just like <laughs> literally every day, step on the mat and like, me so i had a couple buddies after after i moved from oklahoma i had three or four friends who were also into martial arts moved out and started training right and we all had this house together in playa del rey with mats in the back Thank and you. so it was it, it was like an oklahoma crew and literally guys my buddies would have a hit list guys that got put on the hit list like these are the guys that we're taking out tonight if we see them in class like we're putting the hit on them we're just so far like, i agree with everything you're saying tell me more so i mean it, let's be honest isn't there a time and place for a hit list sometimes absolutely okay i'm just just making sure here so we would just have a hit list of guys like okay this guy's giving him a hard time i'm taking him out so uh it, it was kind of funny but it, we would just go to war and um Back then, too, I, I think it was so much more aggressive because, A, it wasn't a kind of tournament. Meant there, there were hardly any tournaments back then. There was no tournaments. Uh, the first few years that I was training, there were still challenge matches going on. So oh, on any given day. Hickson's gym? Yeah. We're um, going to need to spend about six hours talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was fortunate that I, I, I had the opportunity to do a, f a few of them. And um, that kind of helped to kind of mold my mindset of what jujitsu is really for. And that's what for I always, sure. it, it was 
what I moved out there for anyways. It's like, you know, to learn how to fight, right? That's what the first few uh, UFCs was all about. What's the best fighting style or what's the best, if you're gonna do one thing, if you're gonna learn one thing and focus your time on learning one discipline, what's the best? And you know, I think after the first three UFCs, it kind of pretty much established itself. Yeah, the dive was cast. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, back then we, you know, on any given day, there was a chance someone could walk in and want to fight and it would be one of the students. They would call out one of the students or, or you know, me. And Is say, that how yeah, it would go down? Somebody would yeah. open the door and say, hello, I would like to challenge somebody to a fight. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would. I, I worry I come about in, the I sanity of the or... person wanting. I mean, it's awesome. Don't get me wrong, but the sanity of the person wanting to do that. Well, a lot of these guys were martial artists, <laughs> yes, yeah. right? So these guys are have been training for years in a specific discipline, time and energy, money, feel like effort. Yeah, you know, they, it's almost like a, a belief system, right? Like, okay, well, I've been doing this, 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 and if a guy comes and attacks me, that all of this stuff that I've been putting all this time into training is going to work. So. um that that was really cool to be able to train during that time also one of the big things like we used to train all summer no gi we would take the gi tops off and train with like open palm slaps so that was fun that's something that's kind of missing i think from today's environment is like training like that at a lot of schools um and it was just because like hey you know we're gonna have to you're gonna have to learn how to get down you know, we would put on gloves all the time, and one guy would be uh, one guy would be the grappler, the other guy would be the striker, and one guy would okay. Your job is to take me down, and my job is to try to knock you out. I feel like donkey guard really wouldn't be the best a game <laughs> <laughs> for that particular situation. As you, the last thing is you see is your nose going to the back of your head. Yeah, no. <laughs> Backing up, looking in between your legs. Um, yeah, no. I saw it on the Especially internet. not if kicking is allowed. I saw that one time and sent it to Travis. I'm like, is this class material for Monday? And he just sent back the puking face emoticon. He's like, get the fuck out of here with that. So you'd be in class. A dude would throw the door open. He would pick who he got to fight? No. The instructors would pick. Oh. And so a lot of times, so a, a couple times, you know, guys are pretty sly about Sometimes it wouldn't be just an outright challenge. Sometimes guys would come in and go, oh, I want to do a class. I want to take a class. And what they would do during the class is they would see if they could dominate whoever the students were. A test drive, if you will. Yeah, without without saying, <laughs> I really want to fight. And so, you know, we had that many times where a guy would come in tough. You know, you could just see he had a bad attitude, right? He wasn't there to learn. He was there to test himself and he would be picking up slamming guys putting his elbow in their face like really really trying to hurt guys so training kind of but with bad intentions yeah right and um so a lot of times they would be like henry and they would look at me and they would you know give the give the this the signal and uh the that means super secret <laughs> that means <laughs> <laughs> when i call time you're with that guy <laughs> And I'd just be like, got it. Roger and, that. Mad know, enforcement would begin shortly thereafter. Yeah. And that means, you know, snap his arm. How many so. years into training before they started giving you the wink as opposed to other people? So my first challenge match happened, um, I think, four months in. That's not a lot of time. Mm -mm. <laughs> it's Well, it's not a lot of time for most people, right? But yeah. when you're... Oh, you're talking eight hours a day, though. Okay. Training that much, and you're young and somewhat athletic. And, you know, so I was picking it up really, really fast. Um, I got my blue belt in six months, which was, like, unheard of at Hickson's gym. You know, and I, by the time I got my blue belt, I was already kind of already winning competitions as a blue belt, you know. Um, so I was just excelling. And the instructors, I mean, you know, granted... Hickson and the instructors put a lot of time into helping me because they saw how dedicated I was. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my first challenge match was about four months in. And we had this crazy guy come in um, in the morning. He was watching the class. We had a railing there. And he was watching the class. And every time the instructor would um, teach a technique, he'd be like, poof. <laughs> You know, be like, call that the audible air leak. Like, <laughs> you know, so he's literally sitting on the the side of the class, clowning the whole time uh, while the instructor is teaching. So he did that day one. Comes back day two. You know, he leaves like halfway through. Comes back day two. 
doing the same thing. Then he starts pulling out flying stars and starts throwing flying stars into like this wood panel that we have. You know, it, like some of the walls were just, it was a janky old karate gym. And he starts throwing. And uh, so the instructor finally goes, hey man, you've been coming in here the past two days and you know, being super disrespectful, what's your deal? You know, you have a problem, are you here to fight? And he goes, yeah. And so the, uh, the instructor's name is Jason Krikorian. He's a brown blood at the time. He, uh, we had another student named Joe who was about the same size, um, about 185 pounds. He looks at Joe and Joe had been training for probably eight months. So a few months longer than me. He was still a white belt. Um, he looks at Joe and he goes, Joe, take your gi off. And this guy, Joe, looks at him and literally just turned white. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, why are you calling me, you know? And I looked at Joe and I just saw like, he just froze. And I looked at the instructor, I was like, I'll do it. You know, let me, I was like, I gotta make sure this works. If I'm, me putting, in, coach. I'm, put, I'm putting all this time into <laughs> learning this, right? <laughs> this, this stuff better works, so otherwise I'm going back home to Oklahoma. Um, and so the first time we squared up, I, what was the guy's discipline? So, because I, when you were saying the instructor asked him, "Do you have a problem?" I think carrying throwing stars is indicative of having a problem. So, unless he, you're a ninja, which that also, <laughs> if you think you're a ninja, that's indicative of having a problem too. So, kung fu for 15 years <clears throat> okay. and ninjutsu. Oh, <laughs> perfect. Yeah, so deadly combination: kung fu and ninjutsu. So, kung jitsu. Yes, whatever you'd call you it. Just yeah. basically had victim. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> It's so funny because the first thing he did is we square up. I take my gi off. He, we square up. And, he and what gets are the like, rules, by the before you talk about what happened, what are the rules in these square? Like so, close-handed fist, you can – So like, normally what they will a, – a lot of times what they'll do is they'll say, hey, no biting and no eye gouging, right? But this morning it was just you guys are squaring up and you guys are fighting. Okay. So Fair we have was. a full buffet, dinner table yeah, of options. Yeah, it was options. whatever. So this guy gets in some – crazy like long crane stance like with his front <laughs> leg like fully extended out you know just com completely immobile right <laughs> um and the first thing i do is i look at that leg fully extended and so we we have this one kick that we practice a lot in jiu-jitsu which is like a a, a front kick to the knee stomp so him. i yeah front stomp to the knee and so i just started off with that boom stomp end up coming in clinching him took him down and right after we hit the ground he, he started tapping so I got off him. I was like, whoa, okay. He gave up, right? And the instructor's like, no, 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 no. That's not how this is going. He goes, <laughs> <laughs> he goes, you can't tap just because you hit the ground. You know, he goes, that's like Henry tapping, standing up because he's not comfortable on his feet. Yeah. Because you guys are going again. And um, he said, Henry, this time, if he taps, keep going. I was like, okay, cool. You know, he just gave me the, the go ahead. So this time the guy was waiting for me. He knew what I was going to do. And he kind of waited for me to charge in. He caught me with a, a punch coming in, kind of grazed me on the side of the, the cheek, clinched with him, took him down. I took him down and he got me in a headlock, I was cracking him in the ribs. Um, and eventually he let go because he was just holding on tight, you know, not really doing any damage, just squeezing my head. And uh, I was just wailing on his ribs. He let go and I got him in an armbar. He tapped and then I let it go. Um, afterwards, he was sitting on the bench. You know, th th that was basically the, the Gracie Jiu Jitsu uh, promotion campaign. Come in, let us kick your ass, and then sign up. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to ask. How many people who actually came in the door saying they wanted to fight ended up becoming students? So this guy ended up signing up. His, we called him Kung Fu Joe. I actually saw Kung Fu Joe like five years ago. Nice. That was like crazy. He came into my, my old gym dynamics uh, out of the blue. I hadn't seen him in like 15 years or something like that. And I was like, holy crap, Kung Fu Joe. That's the first guy I fought. This is the guy that kind of molded, had one of the most powerful experiences for me in, in Jiu Jitsu. Um, he was sitting on the bench afterwards and he said this to me and this, this I'll never forget it. He said, man, he goes, I've been doing Kung Fu for 15 years, he goes, and I feel like I've wasted half my life. So I was like, wow. I was a white belt. I've been training jujitsu for four months. He goes, you know, he asked me how long I've been training. I said, oh, I've been doing this for four months. He saw that I was a white belt, you know. He's not gonna like that answer. And he's like a black <laughs> sash or whatever, right? <laughs> and he's like, man, I feel like I've, I've 
wasted all of this time, you know? Um, and I just thought to myself, wow, I never want to be that guy. <laughs> right. So that was something that was really, really powerful for me to always remember. Like, I want to make sure that what I'm doing will be effective if I ever need to use it in real combat. Like it's got to be, it's got to work if I ever need to use it, not just based on this belief system that someone says, Hey, you know, if someone does this, just kick them in the balls or just, you know, upper, you know, just throw an open palm to their nose and break their nose and their bones going to go into their brain. Right. Or punch them in the throat. So that begs the question <laughs> to me, how in the hell do you get 15 years into that? And believe that it's the solution that you're seeking. 15 years is a decade and a half. Well, well, check this out. Back then, okay, if you think about martial arts then, nobody really understood the, the effectiveness of grappling. It was very, very few. If you watch all of the old movies, it was Karate Kid was huge, which blew up karate. Then you have Bloodsport and all the Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. And so that was what was being promoted at the time. So everyone thought it was always about stand-up fighting. And stand-up fighting looks cooler. Yeah, but didn't they ever get into a bar fight and be like, oh, that shit doesn't work. There's no crane kick here. Uh, I, you know, like, I think but then you don't have internet, too. You don't have like, people that's actually all over the world point. saying, like, oh, wow, look at these fights. Look at, you know. So you didn't have that transmission of information that you do today. Um, nowadays, you can pull up go to YouTube, pull up a hundred videos and you can see, oh wow, these guys are all falling on the ground all over the place. These guys grabbing his head and going to the ground. If you don't have the experience or you've never seen a fist fight, you're thinking, oh, these guys just stand up and throw punches at each other. I still feel like there's some level of complicity. Of course. On well, the, so but, I would say, and still in America and Brazil, the, the Kung Fu Taekwondo schools are not going out of business. I mean, there's just some people. We're still. on the top so, of one right now. Uh, yeah. yeah, we are yeah. above yeah. Uh, right. Taekwondo Correct. school. Correct. And and just yesterday, John and I were driving by it, and I said, "Oh, there's the Taekwondo school, and there's kids out there." And he goes, "How could any parent in their right mind enroll their kids in Taekwondo, knowing what we know now?" Right. And it is. I mean, I, 15 years ago, I I could understand. But nowadays, there's no excuse, really. I mean, I, I don't think there's anyone on the planet who hasn't seen the UFC. I, I think, I, I honestly think people just don't know. I mean, if you knew a better solution or you knew a better answer, you would do that. And I, th I think a big part of it is, and th this happens with jujitsu schools too. A lot of people go into jujitsu schools thinking they're going to learn how to fight. And the curriculum at a lot of jujitsu schools has nothing to do with fighting, but more, it's more geared towards competition scoring points and so you go in with the belief like oh I've seen this in the UFC or I've seen this on TV and I've heard about it and all these people tell me that this is a great thing to learn if I want to learn how to fight and they go in and put all of their belief in the instructor the instructor says oh yeah I'm gonna teach you jujitsu and so they just okay this guy's teaching me how to fight or this guy's teaching me the art or this guy's and they don't know that there's a difference. And I think that's what happens at a lot of these martial arts schools. We're going to teach you self-defense. Right. You know, you see that term self-defense thrown over, uh, thrown, you know, big letters outside of it. all these martial arts schools. And people just believe, yeah. I'm, okay, this guy's the expert. He's got a black belt. He's been doing this 20 years, so he must know what he's talking about. Right? I don't think too many parents come in to the instructor and say, well, how many street fights have you been in? You know? Yep. I would say this is probably an uncommon onboarding question from the parent. I, I, I would think so too. And, and one thing too, to double back on Kung Fu Joe, um, I would even say he's a rare exception because there's a, I've seen it a bunch of times in the last 20 years where a guy comes in in the same circumstances, that happens, they walk out, and they continue with that sunken yeah. cost fallacy. They don't. They don't sign up. Yeah, because they don't want to face the reality. Well, because they go, I'm 15 years into this. I've spent yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. I'm a black sash or a red belt or whatever, and it's just more convenient to just continue to pretend than to face reality at that yeah, point. Yeah, until you end up in a fucking violent confrontation somewhere, and then it's very inconvenient. Right. Very yeah. inconvenient, whichever it, it, it may be. The human brain sometimes not rational, right? Like, you see it with investments all the time, where people just throw good money after bad. Yeah, that's a good point. So, sport versus this last... How long have you been in town now? A couple weeks? Two? No, three. Go, three plus. 
so he's been teaching a lot of Travis's classes. Nelson hasn't all been of them. At, Nelson all hasn't been at any, but you don't know Nelson, but he'll listen to this, and it just should be noted that he's been at zero classes. <laughs> it's a different story. But uh, almost every class you make the point of talking about, uh, if we're talking about a position, or you'll talk about options, like this doesn't work if we're talking about an environment where you can strike or elbow or knee. Uh, the you know we were doing side control and go into the iron pillow and where you would go flopping and getting the angle versus grabbing and closing the distance to me that makes perfect sense and i can see say you just taught the primary only go to the iron pillow get bladed and didn't add that hey this is not a right. non-competition move <laughs> like if you do this in the striking i just think in the back of my head i'm like okay parking lot at a bar 2 a.m <laughs> right. yeah. This, but this is the influence of Hickson and Henry on our side. But like, um, I think Horian and Hedron and Henry do this as well. There's, but not not that many. It's a minority of people who actually will, you know, weekly one or two classes a week. Okay, you have to have a mouthpiece. You have to have gloves, and not not knocking each other out. The cool yeah. thing is, like you were saying. Open hands, like I can touch your face. I can touch your face, and that fixes everything. You're There's not trying ways to, hate each to other. train, yeah. exactly, and that's and, and that's what I don't think people understood back in the day. Get like that when microphone we, closer. To you when now. we played, uh, oh damn, ooh, there he there is. <laughs> check, check. Um, when when we used to play with open palm strikes, I mean, it was you know you would think like okay, we're just doing slaps. No, these were like full on like oh yeah, whack. Like, that is why I asked you about the mat culture because <clears> I assumed. Oh, we would like. Rolls would stop and everyone would be watching one group go at it and just like literally tagging each other and people's faces would be welted up with <laughs> handprints on people's faces. And we were like, we'd be like, damn. So do you think that the sport jujitsu competition world is a threat? And I use that term broadly, you use it however you want to, to the traditional values of jujitsu and what the Gracie family was originally training for and teaching for. Because I've heard the same argument about judo. They keep they, they'll take things away, or they're adding rules. Yeah. And if you put a rule set on anything, if you're a smart person and you, let's say you're going to make your money doing whatever that thing may be, you're an idiot to not play inside of the rule set and take advantage of everything that you possibly can. But then if you train for only a narrow band of possibilities, real life doesn't care about that. It'll kick you right in the teeth. Yeah. Well, here here's what I will say. Um, I think a lot of instructors are doing their students a disservice because. Most people, when they come in to start learning jujitsu, they want to learn the martial art. They want to learn how to defend themselves. They want to learn how to fight. They want to learn how to protect themselves. Um, and I don't think a lot of instructors make that differentiation of, hey, this is, I'm teaching you a sport, and this is not going to work. Actually, work in real combat, you know. And these situations and these positions will put you in danger. And this, you know, grabbing the sleeves and doing all this stuff might not work if you get no street fight. So. You know, a lot of people make the argument that, um, yeah, just if you learn jujitsu, you're going to know how to fight, right? But, um, I mean, the argument that I have is, look, if you don't train with strikes, right, you're not going to use them in a fight. It's you, you fight how you train. So it's like thinking you're going to throw an uppercut in a fight when you've never thrown an uppercut in your life or throwing a high kick or a knee in a fight when you don't practice that. It's super sweet to see, though, especially about a – six pack or 12 or deep when they're only about three feet away from their target but they snap that fucker and <laughs> ah, they, <laughs> i mean i support that behavior completely i hope they miss their intended recipient but I, i've seen that a few times where guys just they, try ufc moves right just they straight just, straight seen. drunk jitsu and you're like oh that's obviously the first time you've tried fill in the blank <laughs> i've never done this move before but i've seen john jones do it and uh <laughs> how hard can it be a, a spinning backhand and the person's like eight feet away <laughs> so I think it's it's important to practice how you're going to fight, right? Um, and so, yeah, I think I think most students when they come in to do jujitsu, that's what they're actually wanting to learn. Um, and I don't think that is the skill set that a lot of instructors are teaching. And it's not to say that the sport style of jujitsu people can't be highly effective in understanding, you know, knowing how to dominate position, knowing how to control people, but. Um, it's different. It's not. It's like wrestling, right? Wrestling is a highly effective, but you can't go into uh, a mixed martial arts fight only knowing wrestling. I mean, you can. You can. You're not going to do so well, <laughs> <Correct>. right? <laughs> Shooter's so, choice on that one. Yeah, and so um, 
even though wrestling is is an amazing sport, teaches you a lot of skills, it develops your your physical attributes. Um, you know, you're you're doing you're still doing someone a disservice if you say, "Hey, I'm going to teach you how to fight and only teach them wrestling." Yeah, I agree. Well, how much of the training, say you're going five days per week, how much of that would you include striking or open hand contact? When when we were, uh, back I mean, like now for current schools, if they wanted to make sure that the people have it in the back of their mind at all times, like, hey, this position's great. However, you're you know you've committed to once, all of this real estate. I think this, once or twice a week. Once yeah. or twice a week. Okay. Yeah, once or twice a week. Um, and and for me as as the student, one of the things that while I was training, one of the things I would constantly ask myself, just subconsciously in my training, is or you know consciously in my training, is can I get hit in this position? So I like. Every 30 seconds, every 40 seconds. Okay, I'm in this position. Can he hit me right now? And if he can hit me, this is not good, okay? How do I position myself or where do I need to put my hands? Where do I need to be so that, you know, I don't get hit? Were you training stand-up, striking, kickboxing at all with the jiu-jitsu when you moved to L.A.? Or was it purely just – because it's – well, to be honest, that's almost a dumb question because you guys were striking the fuck out of each other. So yeah. there was an aspect of that. But, I mean, like stand-up, boxing, any of that stuff? Were you... No, so, so here's the thing is people don't realize – how much striking we were doing in jujitsu. Yeah, it sounds like it. So that's a huge part of jujitsu. Um, actually, it's something that I, I, I'm i going to cover this weekend. Thank striking. God. Yeah, we're going to... Who requested that, Travis? John Frankel requested yeah. that via me. We're, we're going we're gonna to cover striking because... <laughs> and it's awesome. A lot of people Probably. don't understand, you know, in these positions, right? Like in cross-side, well, what are the tools that you have available to you? What are the strikes? What are the angles? It's like when you're when you're boxing someone you know depending on how the person puts their hands you know where the openings are you know how to set them up you know okay i'm going to throw a punch here he's going to block or he's going to do this so those same skills apply to jiu-jitsu right can i uh uh so kind of on what andy's saying here i agree wholeheartedly with the striking another thing that for me personally that i've noticed and and just getting done with kids comp team um the lack of takedowns that's another thing i see a lot of sports jujitsu schools they're like oh every fight goes to the ground but they teach like zero takedowns like there's no takedowns yeah absolutely and that's a, that's a that is competition jujitsu has kind of killed that because in competition you have another opponent who is a hundred percent willing to go to the ground with you Right. Correct. So both guys, and as a matter of fact, they probably are rushing to get to the ground. They both yeah, and that's sit why both the guys sit. The like yeah. they're they're like, hey, let's just get this over with. Let's just both sit on the ground and let's just put it ourselves on the ground. Um. So, you know, th- most guys, and and even if the guy doesn't want to go to the ground, if you sit, he's got to have to engage you, right? So that's just not the case in a, in a street fight. In a street fight, nobody wants to go to the ground with you, right? And they're gonna fight their for their life to prevent that. Um, if somebody sat down on the ground in front of me at like a bar, I'm like I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> you are an extremely weird person. You win. It'd be like Ryan's brother taking his pants off. Like that's an interesting way to start a fight. Like I'm not going to take the bottom that, that, half that, of my clothing off. But that didn't work for him. Well, it's because you guys were not sober and you just took your pants off. And then it was really awkward. Two men standing, by the way, with their pants around their ankles, like. Both teetering on falling over. I'm just sitting in the hammock drinking beer like, this is amazing. New new training technique, yeah. new training methodologies. <laughs> Train we're, the we're constantly advancing our training yeah. methodologies Correct. here in Montana. I, th- I feel like we found a dead end on that one. Yeah. Probably we did maximal research. <clears throat> but back to the takedown thing. I, I feel like that is as important, if not more, oh, absolutely. than the striking. Because like, how are you going to get the fight to the ground if you don't train takedowns? Well, that's the, I think that's what you saw a huge transition in, um, like Damian Maya. Yeah, his um, skill set when he started competing in uh, MMA, he put a huge focus. Um, he, or, originally, when he first started competing in MMA, he was trying to learn the stand-up game. He was, um, and then he got knocked out by Nate Marquardt. And I think Hickson had a conversation with him afterwards about. He said, "You know, why are you putting so much time into?" you know, trying to learn stand up when these guys are years ahead of you. Did he get knocked out on his feet? Yeah. He charged in, jumped in, and he got knocked out on his feet. Um, I think Hickson emphasized like, man, you're light years ahead of everyone on the ground. Why don't you focus on developing your takedowns? 
and his takedowns got so good. Yeah. He was yeah. dominating Fantastic. his single legs, dominating wrestlers, yeah. NCAA champion wrestlers. Yeah. Like no he, shit, dude. Out, he outfitched John Fitch. Yeah, and Chael Sonnen. Yeah, yeah, he took down Chelsea yeah. with that with little a little Greco, yeah, huh? yeah. A little, I mean, from little, yeah. upper body clinch yeah. and foot, foot sweep. sweep. Yeah, yep. I mean, he got good. So, um, you know, he 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 put a lot of time into developing his takedowns, and that's why he was able to be so exceptional with his jujitsu. Um, you know, where even high level wrestlers are basically running from him. You know, they're not willing to engage from him because uh, they know his his you know his ability to take things. In, and once it gets on the ground with him, you're in a world of trouble. So why don't you add more takedowns into the cap curriculum? Slash, why don't you force people to start matches on their feet? And it's not like you're the owner. I start my matches on the feet. Not always. Uh, anyone who's willing to stand up. Fair enough. But it's a good question. I mean, but I'm it, guilty too. I I, I, I sit down. It, it, it's it, lazy. It, it, I sit down every time because I'm bigger than most people. But I also know the hugest hole in my game is on the feet. So we have a judo program. Yep. At the gym. Um, so people are welcome to pursue t takedowns um we used to have a wrestling class but nobody showed up because wrestling's hard uh and then when it comes to takedowns it's in the curriculum but it's two weeks yeah, yeah. you know it's two weeks it's just another subject but honestly uh people who start training in their 40s 50s uh takedowns are you know w whether you know how to fall or not you're still falling yeah so I don't feel personally comfortable in my ability to control the energy and not hit somebody else. Like at open mats on a Sunday where there's a bunch of people. Oh, if it's packed, it's dangerous. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a you whole need to just draw a blood circle so around how we would do how would we do the our our takedown classes. Usually if we we're 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 doing takedowns, it's the whole class, right? The whole class is focused on takedowns. Which is we'll do, the two weeks that comes up, it's exactly the same. So we'll do, you know, um a few different takedowns that work in transition with each other. Like you go for one, he's gonna counter or defend by doing this, then you can transition to this. And then at the end of class, what we do, um, we don't allow, we because just the mat space, we didn't wouldn't allow people to roll and be doing takedowns at the same time. We would just have takedowns. So there was a couple of different ways that we would do it. Some days we would do, okay, one guy is just going for the takedown, the other guy's job is just to defend, not get taken down. So that way you have one person developing their offense, one person developing their takedown defense. Other days we would have both guys trying to take down. And how we would do it is we would have one guy, so we would set up like three or four pairs. Everyone else would be lined up on the wall so that there's enough space. Because when you're on your feet, there's so much more movement. People running around, people charging in, people backing up. Um, we would have three or four groups and then whoever's back hits the ground first, they're out, the next guy's in. So one guy stays in the middle. And Wall what ends drill. up happening That's is- what I'm talking about. King of the takedown. The guy <laughs> who is staying in the middle usually has some good takedowns or is has more skill. Once they start getting tired, yeah. what will happen is, so so it's kind of a battle of how do you, how do you regulate your, your expenditure of energy so that you can actually stay in yeah. and keep winning these, these takedown battles. Um, you know, and eventually if you stay in long enough, you're going to get tired enough where, you know, because there's so much energy expend. Most jujitsu guys expend so much energy trying to take down. It's, it's most jujitsu guys are kind of like white belts in that takedown area where, you know, when, when you're a white belt and you first start training, you're, everything is just kind of forced. You know, you're just going hard to try to accomplish things. So it's it's the same. Guys get tired really quick when they're doing takedowns. So, yeah, that's that's how we would train the takedowns. And um, it was super helpful. We usually spend, you know, like Travis does, a week or two weeks just doing takedowns and then move on to something else. And But we would kind of keep constantly circle back to that and just focus on takedowns for a couple of weeks, you know. And then we do, you know, clinching drills. Yeah. So, you know, we break apart the training and focus on different aspects of the fight to, you know, one guy is punching, one guy's just trying to get in and, and yeah. close the distance without getting hit. I forget what you called it. I think it, it comes up, I think, in November or December in the curriculum, but you might even call it self-defense. I do call it self-defense. It's the most awesome two weeks because it's, one attack, the other takes him to the ground. Switch, mm -hmm. and it's the what you're talking about. Close the distance, get through the range of being able to hit. Yep. Clinch down. Yeah, it's two weeks where we we, we work takedowns, but we but the also add the strikes in. The attendance goes like this. Oh, that's right. too bad. You Except know for the people who love it, and we're just like fuck yeah, this. Is yeah. Awesome. Well, <laughs> well, it's so uncomfortable, right? It's so uncomfortable for people to th have punches thrown at their face. 
Yeah. So, I mean, you know, jujitsu is uncomfortable enough just having someone dominate you physically, just wrestling with you, being on top of you. But then you add in punches. That was the same thing at, at, at my gym in L.A. Um, when we would do MMA classes, most of the guys are like, this is the best class. The guys that were coming, like, this is the, the best class. Like, all of the classes should be this. Um, but you'd have four members. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it just so uncomfortable. And even though the training, you know, the way that we do the training is it's a very, very soft training, right? Meaning when we're throwing strikes, we're never throwing strikes to injure yep. our training partner. And that's something I always emphasize, like, hey, you're just throwing strikes to let them know, like, hey, you're exposed here. Or from this position, you can be hit. So, but you're still throwing strikes. So the guy who's throwing the strikes is learning, like, hey, okay, in this position, these are the strikes available. We do elbows, knees, uh, you know, punches, kicks. Um, so, but man, for a lot of people, the panic, and what's, what the other thing too is the intensity is different because a lot of times in jiu-jitsu when you are in a bad position you can rest right when there's strikes involved when you're in a bad position there's no way you can rest because you're getting hit and so you have to move so the pace is always a lot quicker a lot more intense the only time that you can really rest is if you're in the dominant position and you decide okay i'm just going to hold right now and not throw any strikes so how long did your journey continue under Hickson? How long did you stay training with him at that gym? Um, 15 years. Fuck. So, yeah. Long time. How many times in that time period would people come in there and want to try to get a piece of Hickson? Or did that ever happen? You know, so after the Angio fight, there was a, a famous fight um, he talked about on Joe's podcast where the guy from Japan, pro wrestler, came in to yes. fight him. Um, and he kind of made an example out of that guy. He, uh, just know, a little like, a little bit. Quit coming here. <laughs> if you come here and try to fight me, you know. This is what be will happy. happen to you. Yeah, be happy if you walk out alive, pretty much. Um, I can get behind. That's like a bumper sticker. It's like driving yeah. up your driveway. <laughs> <laughs> so they had sure. pictures of Angelo after the fight, right? And his face is just. The, there's those a, recently reappeared on like Facebook, I think. Yeah. So I don't know about this fight. Oh. Oh. Henry, tell him. Many people may not either, so we might as well unpack this okay. a touch. So here's what happened. Um, what year is this? This is 95. Can you okay. unpack that campfire? I can. Only if Hick, only, I almost called him Hickson. Only if Henry talks closer to the mic. He will. <laughs> so Hickson was fighting he's, in Japan. He's going to want something else. That's, Shit. No, I can deal with this. This has an antelope on it. I'm good. The Irish car bombs come out next, Henry. Okay, okay. okay. Irish car bombs. <laughs> I was last man standing last time we did those. I, that's probably true. Uh, I was talking. That's not what Travis uh, told me. Uh, I was uh, trapped. I, we went. We went and had uh, pizza at the end of the night. I'm like, "Where's Andy?" And he's like, "Oh, this is what Andy well, always that's does. Not being yeah. that's, he buys us all drinks, gets us all hammered, and then just no, no, I'm hammered I, too. You guys are <laughs> hammered by yourself. Irish exit." Yeah, the Irish and exit. How many times have you get a and chance John, to John Irish Kavanaugh exit still standing Irish there? Dude. And how bad is it when John Kavanaugh, who always Irish exits and is Irish, turns to me and says, "Where's your tough Navy SEAL, buddy?" I'm like, he Irish exits. First off, I took so much pleasure he watching him. Irish you. I took so much pleasure watching him visibly sweat when the tequila shots were coming, and he would take it in his face. He'd just be like. And he, it would go down, and you just see him questioning what, his life what choices. You, what like, you didn't know about was when you weren't looking, he came to me, he's like, who is this guy, and why are we doing car bombs and tequila? <laughs> he's like, I'm going to throw up. I'm like, don't yeah. throw up. And also, when you're around an Irish dude, if you've never had the chance to Irish goodbye an Irish person, you have to try it at least yeah. one time. Well, you did more than try. For sure. It's my signature move. To be like, hey, guys, I'm going to order something at the bar at the hotel. <laughs> 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 All right, so the Angio fight. So the Angio fight. So Hickson was fighting in Japan in an event called the Valley Tudo, because uh, Hoist was fighting in the UFC. Uh, Valley Tudo, it was back then, the rules, see, I think a lot of people don't understand back in the day the rule set for fighting and how fights used to go. So back in the day, there was no weight division, and you had to fight three guys in one night to win. It was tournament style. Yeah. So back in the early days of the UFC, pe people forget how badass Hoist is. Right. He had to fight in an octagon. He had to fight three guys in one night. There was no gloves. You could groin strike. You could throw punches to the groin. The only rules were no biting and eye gouging. Headbutt, soccer yeah. kick. Head butts were allowed. All of it. Soccer kicks were yeah. allowed. It was gnarly. 
and you had to fight th- no weight divisions, right? Nowadays, like the yeah. the rule set nowadays, where you have weight divisions and you have rounds, no rounds back then either. Yeah. So you know, Hoist's fight with Dan Severin, fights. yeah, fourteen. Wait a minute, there was no rounds. No, no rounds till it ended. Yeah. Till it ended. There, there was, was no time cap. It was. It was Thunderdome <laughs> times three. Nothing you said surprised me up until no rounds. I, I, I did re- not realize. I remember watching and actually, fights and complains about minutes. rounds because you can, it's like doing CrossFit. I'm going to go really hard for five minutes, get my points. Yeah. I'm a rest. Yeah. Well, the yeah. problem with rounds is at five minutes, they stand you back up, you go back to your corner and you can rest. And it gives the grappler a lot less time because sometimes it takes a couple minutes just to get the guy to the ground. Yeah. If you're a grappler and the other guy knows you're trying to take him down, he can defend. And what happens is you end up on the ground, right? With one they minute s- left, yeah. And, and then maybe a minute starts left. standing. But yeah. yeah, but what happens is they start you standing again, they start <clears> you <throat> back on your feet at a, at a distance, yeah. right? And so that gives a huge advantage to the striker. Right, they don't yeah, start course. you back. Okay, you guys were on the ground. Let's put start you back, back on here on the ground in the same position. So that gives a huge advantage to to, and so that's one of the things you know. With when he was fighting later in Pride, they made those rules where you know ten minute, you know, I think first it was a round, f- first round, ten, was minute, ten first minutes. round, to give the guy more time to work, the more the grappler a little bit more time. But um, so back then the Valley Tudos, he was fighting Valley Tudo had to fight three guys in one night to win. Um, this guy, Anjo, started talking smack about Hickson in Japan, was, you know, kept challenging him, kept challenging him. Hickson was like, if you want to fight me, put up some money. The guy ends up flying to LA with a bunch of members of the Japanese press saying that he's going to kick Hickson's ass. So that morning he comes in to the academy. I wasn't there, but this is, you know, I heard all the stories and it's pretty funny because there, there's, we had these green mats that I used to lay out every morning. I used to lay out the mats in the morning, set up the academy. And there was one mat that I was always put down. These were like these old fold out mats, right? That were just worn down to like, they, they were, you probably used to be about an inch and a half and they were worn down to about a quarter inch. So you were rolling <laughs> on basically a t-shirt on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on top of like wooden floor, right? Karate floor. <laughs> Um, and there was one mat with a giant blood stain in it that would never come out. The mat was worn down, like the vinyl was worn down so that you could see like the, the fibers <laughs> and there was a giant blood stain. And I'd always put that on that mat and be like, yeah, that was Angio's face. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy comes in with all these members of the Japanese press from Japan, challenges Hickson. Hickson's not there. He doesn't teach the morning class. So Hickson um, didn't know he was coming. Didn't know he was coming. Awesome. Ambush. They called basically. him. Yeah, they ambushed him. They called him at his house in the Palisades, and uh, it, the two instructors there at the time, Luis and Mauricio, call Hickson at his house and say, Hickson, we don't know what's going on. There's this Japanese guy here. Um, he won't talk to us. He said he only wants to talk to you. Hickson already kind of knew who it was. So he jumps in the car, grabs the video camera, has Kim grab the video camera. Kim is driving to the academy. Um, and Hickson's taping up his hands the whole time, you know, taping up his hands as he's driving down. <laughs> Get some. <Fuck>. So, yes. <laughs> comes in, you know. Time to clock in. And uh, this Japanese guy's warming up as, Dude, as Hickson. Didn't he have like a fever or a flu or a cold or something? He was, Hickson? Some yeah. yeah, he was, he was, he was not He wasn't healthy. He, wasn't he was, he was resting, great. yeah. But uh, so he comes in. Um, he knew it was Angio. And uh, the guys try to get him to sign the waiver. Hey, sign the waiver. And Hickson's like, no, fuck that. Throws the waiver out. He says, kick the Japanese press out. So kicked all the members of the press out. Has the guys close the door. And they're holding up geese over. They had these two little windows. It was like folding <laughs> doors, like swinging doors. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hold the geese out so they can't see, right? So they square up. You know, Hickson takes them down pretty quick. Gets on top, mounts him, starts punching him. There's a, a punch that you hear, and you hear a loud crack. That was his, Angio's nose going. Um, Angio is trying to get out of the mount and just wiggles, and they actually wiggle underneath this railing, and Hickson's throwing punches and keeps hitting his elbow on the railing as he's throwing punches. And they're like, rip, so they rip the railing off. <laughs> 
<laughs> so that Hickson, and Hickson drags him back to the middle. Eventually, the guy turns his back. Hickson puts him to sleep, right? But literally, like the guy was begging for mercy, and Hickson just wouldn't stop. It was like a beatdown. They yeah, everyone thought today. that it was gonna kill him, you know. So after he chokes Andrew out, face down, he's laying in a puddle of blood. A puddle of blood had formed underneath his head, and he's unconscious. He goes, "Okay, let them in now." So the Japanese press comes back in, and he's laying face down in a puddle of blood. So they literally thought Hickson murdered him, and the manager is bawling, crying, like screaming. And they pick him up, you know. And then all the the you know magazines, all the press are taking pictures of his face just being completely destroyed. And Hickson's sitting there, like just like <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a bull, you know. And he's just jacked at the time, right? And his hands like taped up, blood all over his hands. Um, so that was pretty much, you know, <laughs> kind if of you come here, things depth brought it back to like a two after that. <laughs> yeah. there, there's a great still shot of exactly what Holy Henry just described. Oh, and, and Hickson looks like the devil. Man. Oh yeah. He looks, he, so, he looks so scary. Yeah. And yeah. when he has like, he, he'll get those eyes when he yeah. looks at you, you just know like, fuck man, I fucked up. This is the wrong, like I did had no idea what I'm getting myself into. Right. What was rolling with him? Like, <sighs> <laughs> That noise is what Frankel describes rolling with you as like. Pretty much. <laughs> it's um, it, it's hard to explain, you know, because you never really know where he's where he's at. What he's there's days where I would train with him and I felt great and I was like, man, wow, I did good today. And then literally a couple months later, when I'm better, he'll train with me and literally just run through me, like tap me out every minute. Um, and he would do that with the best of the best guys, you know? So that's the crazy thing. I would see all of these world champions coming from Brazil, all of the young studs at the time, world champions. And I always would think, okay, this is the guy that's gonna, <laughs> this guy's been killing everybody. This guy's been destroying him. He's been submitted. He submitted all the guys this last tournament, all the black belts he went against. This is the guy that's gonna give Hickson a hard time. And then literally every single time my jaw would be on the ground. I would just be like, no way. <laughs> he would just you know it was it, it's so hard to gauge his level because he's just so much better than everyone he would make everyone look like a white belt and you know one of the most common things you would hear from all of these black belts who had the experience or had the opportunity to train with him some of the things they would say is i feel like i don't know any jujitsu or i felt like a white belt or i felt helpless that was that's kind of the common thing everyone would say you know i had guys i would bring up friends that would train with him and they would literally take their belts off and throw them away be like i don't deserve this belt like because so you told a story about this in vegas we can leave names out of this but it involved a black belt in a garbage can on the way out the door mm. <laughs> yeah well that's 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 public that, that that guy that guy that guy that that was dave camarillo okay and at the time he was one of the top um, American competitors. Um, so I brought Dave up there to train with Hickson. And Dave wrote about it. He wrote an yeah, article. He wrote it. He was super yeah, honest. He wrote yeah. about it. And Dave and Dan are both great judo They're guys. Well, awesome. Too. Yeah. Great judo guys. I just remember you saying you were rolling with your purple belt buddy at the time and then you caught out of the corner of your eye that well, it was oh, that, on. Yeah, that well that was a different that was a different guy. <laughs> that was a different guy. The one where that was Dave who threw his belt in the trash. And uh <laughs> he you know, he talks about it because he just felt helpless. And at the time, I mean Dave was amazing. First, he's like an amazing judoka. Um, you know, he was the he was the head coach at AKA for for a while, the head jujitsu coach at AKA. So, um, and training guys like Fitch and Koscheck and all those guys. So, um, yeah, after he rolled with Hickson, you know, he literally threw his belt in the trash. Um, he was just like, man, I felt helpless. He couldn't do anything. Any of his like his strongest aspects of his game, he couldn't pull anything like off. Like a knife through butter. Yeah, and Hickson just, you know, and what's crazy is he rolled with him and two other two or three other of the top guys from house because the, all of the guys from house would come down and kind of hang out at my house stay at my place it was i had like a jujitsu hostel in la it was like a three-bedroom apartment all jujitsu guys and we had mats in our living room and anytime guys from other schools would come we would just like you know we were all just poor jujitsu athletes right so everyone could just stay at my house um and so i brought all those guys up and they trained and hickson literally just ran through each of them like multiple times and made it does look he like, look like he's working for it or is he just efficient and just slicing through the butter 
I mean, I would see him tap guys out without breaking a sweat. So that's what's, you know, and obviously it's not like he's not human, yeah. you know, but to be able to tap a high level guy out within 30 seconds and then do it again. It's like, do you see that match with Buchecha and uh, Hodger Gracie? Yep. I yes. That match? So everyone's like blown away by that match. Like, holy crap, that match is so amazing. And it is, it's absolutely incredible. You know, you have a guy, Hodger, who hadn't competed in Jiu Jitsu and Gi in five years, comes back and beats, I think Buchecha is like an eight time world champion or something yeah, like that. Something 10 crazy. 10 years younger, yeah. Does 10 Buchecha years younger. actually stand for Cheeks? Uh, it's it's, it's about, his nickname. Yeah. It's yeah. the lamb chop, the mutton chop. Okay, I, think, I thought know. it meant like I, fat like cheeks. Squir- 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 damn, that's yeah. a shitty, shitty. It's nickname. squirrel cheeks. <laughs> okay, he has puffy cheeks, yeah. like a you squirrel. Know, so Buchecha is twenty five pounds heavier. They consider him the most athletic heavyweight of all time. And then Hodger, you know, once the fight hits the ground, Hodger submits him within two minutes. Incredible, right? So I would see Hickson do that to the current world champion five times in a row, six times in a row. So he wouldn't just tap them out once. He would make sure, like, hey, just so you know, that wasn't luck. Yeah. And it was... Neither was the second time. (laughs) And just in case you thought that was luck, here's a third. Right. And just in case you thought that was luck, here's a fourth. (laughs) It it was insane. I mean, I would see him... There were times where guys would come from Brazil. Hoyler would bring a team from Brazil, and he would line up 25 guys on the wall, and he would shark tank himself. So he would sit in the middle of the mat, and basically pull out one guy, tap him out five times, next guy five times. And he would literally sit in the middle of the map for an hour and roll with guys and just run through guy after guy after guy without without getting a drink of water. <laughs> so it's pretty it's pretty crazy because back then, you know, there, no there's no video footage of it, right? And it's so hard for people to believe that someone actually has that skill level unless you've seen it or experienced it yeah, yourself. But, but you also hear it directly from those guys. Like, you hear it from the like guys. Like in Solo's book, like uh, Jiu Jitsu University, like right in the in the um, beginning, he talks about rolling with Hickson and he says it right there. This is the arm bar that Hickson gets me with every time we roll. Yep. So when you hear it from guys who are at that level. Yeah. And all of the, all of the guys that have had the opportunity to roll with him, you know, say it. But, you know, there's 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 a certain level of mysticism within the jujitsu community, too, because it's so hard. It's like, you know, seeing a UFO, you know, all these people that have seen UFOs like I know it exists. I saw it. I was there. And everyone's (laughs) like, you're full of shit. (laughs) Yeah, right. What were you, you know? So what do you think it is about Hickson that gives him that ability? Um, I I think it's multiple things. I think uh, obviously he's very into his conditioning right his his athleticism now he was never the the biggest or the strongest of the guys but he had an amazing combination of size strength endurance his endurance is through the roof i've actually never seen him what's his height weight five foot ten and uh, he 175 in the earlier years and by the time he his last fight he was 205 when he fought Funaki, he bulked up, but his usual weight was about 185. Walk around 185? Mm-hmm. 5'10", 185. Fuck, so I have two inches and 20 pounds in him. Okay, I, for some reason I thought he was like 6'3". Yeah. Nope. No, no, no. 480. No, not a not a, <laughs> not a very, I mean, yeah. you know, by our standards, not a huge dude. Um, and so, you know, he, he had a great combination of strength, speed, uh, endurance was always his thing. And so, like, if you've ever seen that documentary choke one of the things he really focuses on is his breathing yeah and the way he's like in a stream in japan or something like that yeah so breathing exercises yep exactly and so that's you know that he attributes a lot of success success in jiu-jitsu to his breathing and to his ability to not get tired that's a huge thing a concept in jiu-jitsu is not only having um you know that's a big thing with the efficiency training and not using any more strength than you need to to get the job done and um his the pace that he was able to put on and force other guys to keep up with he would gas dudes out and just knowing how to breathe and and his breathing regimen as he was by the way i have a a present for you okay um that's super non sequitur but i'm I'm on board (laughs) (laughs) he's breathing and i have a present for you (laughs) well i i i I brought you a book from uh from a breathing coach that i work with belisa veranich so i just try to hold my breath in the most compromising positions (laughs) Just hold your breath. Yeah, until you go out. And okay. Then just ask if you won. 
No, <laughs> then when you wake up. I just try I try I try to control my breathing, but like oh. I roll with John and I can tell he's trying to breathe through his nose. Yeah. I'm not at that level yet. I'm in full fucking survival mode. Uh, breathing breathing is so crazy. I mean it's 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 such a necessary component for our athleticism yeah. and for endurance and everything. Yeah. And I think it's it's just something that nobody focuses on in athletics. I think just now there's a, a lot of information starting to come out. I just read a couple books on breathing. Um, and so it's now just starting to come more into light, like how important it is for athletic performance and we, recovery. We have a guy at the Whitefish Gym, Logan, who I would say in the last five days- Has gotten it was, way better. It was one of you two said- He made him hold water in Go get a, a mouthful of water. That was me. Yeah. And we're gonna roll. And. It, that reminded me of my inner buds instructor, which is amazing. I would yeah. have him go get a mask full of seawater and then a mouthful of seawater and do wind sprints. It's pretty awesome because it's impossible, <laughs> but I get to set the rules. So fuck you. And, uh, but he, um, Logan's awesome. First off, he loves YouTube. So the shit he will try on you is unbelievable. He has oh, awesome. no understanding of the, like the leverage that he needs to use, but he'll go for this crazy shit since day one. I miss his flowing hair, actually. He came in day one. Just go for it. Fifth gear. Encino man. Dude, fifth gear, hard in the paint at the old Whitefish gym. He would, mm -hmm. and By the time we got to open mat at the end of the class, he's in the fucking corner fetal from the drilling. <laughs> and, but he is like, smile, nicest guy ever yeah. attitude. But last week, they started talking to him about his breathing. Okay. And so it slowed him way down. And I've been trying to roll with him a bunch. I'm like, we're going to have the slowest roll you've ever had. And we start slow. And his shit is way better. It is just because yeah. he's focusing on his breathing. He's thinking. He actually if, he actually performed the best of everybody today in Whitefish. Did he? In terms of the technique, yes, I yeah. thought. Awesome. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. And so, you know, going We're back to five your, days, that that difference that I saw in him, I would say, is five days and just slapping hands with him. Yeah, and just being conscious about what you're doing with your your yeah. breath and breathing, and, and that's a common thing in jiu-jitsu that I tell everybody. People tend to hold their breath because they're exerting so much. They're like. Arr, arr, now, full disclosure, constantly... he'll control his breathing for about two minutes to two minutes and thirty, and then it's a wild ride. <laughs> but he's gonna he's gonna get that the three you gotta minutes. Start somewhere. <laughs> you gotta start somewhere, right? He forgets about halfway through, and then you feel it yeah. dump into fifth gear, and you're like, "Oh shit, time to strap in." <laughs> but that's that 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 was a huge thing about Hickson is his ability not to get tired. You know, he his his breathing was huge in that, um, and then his mind. I mean, he he's so analytical when it comes to jiu-jitsu he he's so deep in his level of understanding i mean even during the the last few years training with him he was constantly evolving his jiu-jitsu constantly improving everything that he was already, i mean he was already the best right guy in the world he had been the best guy in the world for you know 20 years but he was still improving things and still learning taking things like guys from Brazil would come because the the game was evolving so much in Brazil with the competition. Um, he was still looking at those things and still learning and breaking the techniques down and figuring out better ways of doing things. That's awesome. How long did it take you to get your black belt underneath him? Um, eight years. That had eight and, and a half years, yeah. Pretty hell of an experience receiving your black belt straight from Hicks and Gracie. Yeah. I mean, you know, I it was always the goal that I set out to do is – get my black belt at the time at the time when I moved to LA um, no American had ever gotten a black belt from Mixon and so that was my goal I was the third American to get a black belt from him um, and it was huge it was huge but for me when I compare myself to that standard I never ever felt worthy you know, I it's mean, a common you, theme I've heard from almost every black belt. It's such a high standard to, to compare yourself to. I, I'm like, I'm a black belt. Hickson's a black belt. And I know he's got, a, you know, a bunch of stripes in the belt, but like, there's no way I deserve to wear this belt. Like, so when he gave me the belt, man, I didn't, I didn't even want it. It was a huge honor, but I was like, man. And, and even when he gave me my brown belt, I was like, Hickson, you know, I, I don't, I refused it. I said, Hickson, I, I don't feel like I'm ready for this. You know, I don't, I don't, it, like I appreciate it and I'm you know I know I trust you and but I don't feel like I'm ready and he was always you know he what he told me he's like look you're a brown belt he goes and in time you'll be a great brown belt you know but you deserve it and so you know wore the belt but man I when you're comparing yourself to to him it's just so it's such hard shoes to follow in yeah I can only imagine so how long have you been a black belt now so I've been a black belt now, um, when I get 2004, so 16 years. 16 years, so twice as long as it took you to get it. 
Yeah. Your understanding of jujitsu now versus your understanding of jujitsu then. Oh, it's completely different. It's cra- it's <laughs> crazy, and that's the yeah. thing is, it's the beginning of the journey. Is the I narrative I hear from almost everybody. A lot of times, when you know, and I, when I tell people, I say, when I got my black belt is when I first really understood what jujitsu was. You start, you have like an understanding of what jujitsu is, and um, it just continues to evolve. You know, the last five, six, seven years, the quest for me has really been, how do I continue to have the same effectiveness using less energy and so the goal is for me the last few years is is becoming more efficient with my energy using less energy to achieve the same results you know and then developing my understanding of weight distribution better like understanding how to use my weight more effectively to create pressure because you know obviously if you use like there's two ways people create pressure with jiu-jitsu one with strength by holding tight by gripping hard by squeezing or you can create pressure with weight and that's one of the things that hickson was a master at is using his weight you know people that train with him come and say they felt like they were drowning training with him because it was just like a, a lead blanket on top of you couldn't even move and every move it's like you're swimming in quicksand um and so he was so good at positioning his weight anywhere that you wanted to move that literally to be able to move in that direction or do what you needed to do you had to exert like all of your energy you know while he's exerting minimal but he's just laying on you yeah the energy bar is going down for yeah didn't you describe rolling with henry like basically having a waterbed on top of you Uh, i have a lot of descriptions (laughs) one of the no one of the best things like one of the best things henry said to me was was like a light bulb moment it goes back to your last question was he's like look there are equal or bigger differences between individual black belts than there are between white belts and black belts, right? Yeah. You said it to me, and I'm like, I thought about it, and I'm like, it's absolutely true. Well, if you think about it, mo- they, they say on average it takes 10 years to get from white belt to black belt. I've been a black belt for 16 years. So the range, and you never stop as long as you're practicing, as long as you're training, you're going to keep getting better, right? That That's a never-ending, you know. But and also it, a difficult concept for some people to wrap their head around, that there is, that the end state as you move, the end state is moving in front of you the entire time as well. Yeah, there's no end to it, which is... Unlike the Black Sash Man. It's inspirational for me yeah. that to know that, hey, look, the more time and energy I commit to this, I'm only going to, I can keep getting better. There's no, there's no end. You know, I think a lot of people think like, oh, I want to just get my black belt, get to this point. But um, I mean, there's, and that was a huge thing for me seeing Hicks and how, how much better he was than all of the number one guys, you know, any given year, like this current world champion to see what he could do with those guys, guys that were 15 years younger, 20 pounds heavier, you know, tapping everybody out in the black belt division and to see what he could do where he would you know, tap guys out every 30 seconds or every 45 seconds or every minute and a half, you know, just see him run through and back to back to back to back, you know. Um, So that was always kind of a focus, like how do I develop myself so I can achieve that, you know. You ever met people that you refuse to teach jujitsu to? We've kicked out guys from the gym. Yeah, so uh, there's been guys at my gym that we've had to kick out. For what reasons? Just hurting training partners, being super aggro, you know, and just not getting, not getting it, um, that, you know, we all need each other to get better. Um, I think a lot of people when they, you know, there's certain people where it's, it's unintentional and they just don't know any better and they don't realize that they're using strength or spazzing out or whatever. But, um, yeah, once you sit down and have that talk with them multiple times, you know, you kind of have to say, look, is it worth more students getting injured or not? And there's, you know, also guys that have bad attitudes, right? There's a lot of guys that have bad attitudes and you're like, do I really want to give this guy superpowers? Weaponizing predators? Yeah. So, you know, um, I, I think there's a huge responsibility on the instructor's part in, in making sure when you're you're sharing this knowledge with someone, you know, there's some responsibility behind that, right? Yeah. 
So the guy you caught rolling with Hickson out of the corner of your eye, you were that guy. You were rolling with your. Purple, I was rolling with my purple you, belt. You buddy. described it to me as like I was having my death match with my normal purple belt buddy. Yeah. And then we caught out of the corner of the eye that the show was on, and we immediately stopped. The what's so funny is we stopped. <laughs> we're like, oh shit, it's going. Well, here's what the thing is, Hickson. We didn't expect Hickson to train that day because he hadn't trained in nine months. He was coming off an injury, right? He he had a really bad groin injury, and he was resting his groin because he was trying to get healthy enough to get a fight, right? And so he wanted to be healthy enough that he could train for a fight. And they were, you know, throwing out uh, opponents at him. And um, you know, his last fight, he was probably made like a million dollars for. But he was he was the highest paid MMA fighter during his time. So he was trying to get healthy to be able to do this fight in Japan. So he wasn't training at all. And, uh, you know, we had this guy come in, multiple time world champion, just got back from winning the Pan Ams and uh, mauling everybody. And um, Hickson comes up, come, shows up at the, the school to teach class that day. And at the end of class, the guy asked him to train. We didn't know this. Hickson goes, okay guys, everyone let's train. Boom, we all start rolling. Out of the corner of my eye, I say, oh, shit, they're going. <laughs> and immediately stop what I'm, I'm doing. I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah. So we can we're roll any time. Yeah. And literally, yeah. within a few minutes, the whole mat's cleared off. There's like 40 of us training, right? And literally within a few minutes, the whole mat is cleared off. Everyone's just sitting watching. And they're going back and forth, back and forth, high pace. You know, After about five or six minutes, Hickson catches him in an arm bar from a guard. Is this like his favorite move? You brought up armbar too. He's got a pretty legit armbar there. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Hickson, you know, it's, I asked Hickson once, I said, um, what is your strongest position? And he said, my guard. He goes, I don't even think I can pass my guard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he was a modest man. <laughs> hey, when you know, you know, right? I guess, fuck. All right, so they're they're at it. He catches him with an arm. Armbar arm from the guard. Slap hands, go again. And after about two or three minutes, the guy taps. Hickson's cross-eyed on him, and the guy taps. And I'm just like, I asked my buddy John, who's sitting right next to me, I was like, dude, what did he get him with? Did you see? He's like, no, nah, man, no, nah, I didn't see. So after class, I asked Hickson, I said, Hickson, I didn't see what was that last thing you, that you caught him with. He said he tapped to the pressure. I was like, what? <laughs> and because he tapped to pressure, he goes, listen. He goes, I knew that he was going to come at a really intense pace. He's in great shape right now. He goes, I haven't trained in months. My groins hurt. I knew that the pace was going to be hard. So what I did is I made him carry my weight for all of these minutes. Um, and he, he just forced him to get tired, you know, and after a while, guys you know when they're going at that intensive pace and you're working that hard it's you used to do crossfit right yep. so imagine doing a crossfit workout where hickson's 185 pounds so you're grabbing 185 pounds from the ground picking it up over your head and you're doing that non-stop for five minutes while every time you exhale your ability to inhale gets a little bit less and, and then less yeah. and less so your breathing volume is decreasing right and then someone's you know compressing your chest oh, right so your lungs shit can't expand so long before that guy did <laughs> so that's exactly what happened he, you know he was basically laying on his chest keeping putting his weight on his chest which is it's a it's a skill that you learn in jiu-jitsu how to use your weight efficiently to not only make it harder for people to move but to make it harder for people to breathe right and um you know there's a really famous match in metamorphs that i always give an example of which is a match with dean lister and josh barnett where um, the match had gone on for 20 minutes and the last minute of the fight, uh, Josh catches Dean in this move with scarf hold and Dean taps. Now, Dean is considered one of the, the best American grapplers ever. He's a two-time ADCC champion. And before that match, he hadn't been submitted in competition in 14 years. Fuck. Since he was a purple belt, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. He tapped to pressure. So yeah, you're talking scarf about scarf hold is an interesting type of pressure. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that it's pressure, <laughs> but it's a uh, it's drowning <clears throat> on dry land. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's 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 
you know what I always explain it's 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 a s- asphyxiation it's you hear about things like that happening in earthquakes where something heavy yeah, falls on someone's you. chest and what happens is your lungs can't expand to breathe to take in oxygen and people die from asphyxiation right um, and that's why obviously the breathing is so important understanding knowing how to take in oxygen knowing you know different parts of your body where you can breathe from and how to change you know and that was one of the, you know the big things with Hickson is understanding how to breathe even if someone's laying on top of your chest breathing through your, your back or breathing you know lower down through your belly so 24 years what's been the highlight of the journey there's too many to 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 mention um any one thing stick highlight. out any one th- you know I feel so blessed I mean with jujitsu, it's been such a massive blessing in in my life. Um, it mainly comes down to all of the people. I mean, look, at, I'm sitting here with you guys hanging out, you know, getting to do hang hang out with you and do your podcast. So, I, I think the the main thing for jujitsu for me is the relationships and the bonds that it builds between people. Um, when you talk about the things that bring joy to people's life, right? I think everybody knows it has nothing to do with money. Um, there's so many people that have all this money and fame and they, you know, kill themselves. Right. I think, uh, what it really comes down to is good and healthy relationships in your life. The, the more of that you have in your life, the better your life is, the more rich your life becomes. And so, um, that's the biggest thing for me is man, all of the people, all of my best friends in my life are all from jujitsu for the most part. So, so how about the other side of that coin? What's been the low point in the 24 years? Um, I had a Hickson son who was my best friend at the time uh, passed away um, was you know killed and um, that was really really tough that was a time I was a purple belt at the time and um, we were training partners we train every day together and we were supposed to get our brown belts together you know and at the time I'm 25 he's 18 you know you kind of envision a future together like yep. oh man it's going to be so cool when we're doing this together that together um and i had not at that age i had not experienced death yet anyone super close to me uh, and so when he passed away um first time that i experienced it, he was like a brother yeah you know? close so personal loss it, it was very very difficult for me to come back i stopped doing jiu-jitsu for about six months i i went to like a deep state of depression um and uh it was just very, very difficult for me to come back and, and start training. And, you know, like anything, it just it's just something that takes time and something, you know, you had to spend time and process, right? Um, and so that was that was an extremely difficult time. But um, I nowadays, when I look back and I talk about that experience, um, I also realize what a gift it was, you know? Um, and I always tell people, so, that was my first best friend that died. I had my two other best friends die um, one year after that, and the next year after that, they all three. My three best friends all died three years in a row. Um, so, don't become my best friend. Yeah, no Just shit. Letting you know. That was actually the first thought that did run through my mind. <laughs> if I'm being totally honest, <laughs> I'm like, I see a pattern here. I'm not smart, but yeah. So, <sighs> that's rough. That's a lot of personal loss in a short period of time. Yeah, and especially at such a young age, because you don't. You know, I think a lot of times that towards the end of life, you expect like, yeah, that's kind of more on your mind. Like, okay, I, you know, yeah. we're getting older. You don't expect 25, 26 to be losing yep. your friends. Um, and I, I'm sure you've dealt with a ton of that. And I, I think it's almost easier though, when it's, uh, you know, my mom dying versus friends dying. It's, it was easier to deal with my mom gets diagnosed with cancer and you know, I can lay it out mm-hmm. versus you spread out, you come back at the end of the night. And you're like, what, who the fuck is that in the stretcher? Like, that's a tougher one to deal with. Yeah, for sure. When it's unexpected and, and, you know, all three were unexpected surprise. Um, And it made like looking back now, you know, I tell people, I mean, during that time, you know, went into a deep state depression. The second one was easier for me to deal with because I had kind of, you know, dealt with the first one and kind of, um, but it just makes you appreciate people so much more. You know, you kind of learn 
I learned at a very young age, don't take people for granted. Don't take your time for granted um, because it can happen anytime. You can go. Don't leave things unresolved. You know, um, Make sure you tell people that are close to you that you love them. You know, let them, you know, we always expect people to know. And like, that's the thing is I always tell my friends before I get off the phone with them, I love you, man. I just yep. want you to know that because it's important. Right? And it would be one of the worst things left unsaid. Yeah. So it, it was, it was a very um, tough time, but I, I learned so much. And I always tell people, I like, when I think about death now, it's, it's a gift because without it, we wouldn't value our time. Oh, for sure. Right. If we if we had forever, then I could do it tomorrow, or I could tell them later, or I'll wait a few months before I reach out to that person and make up because I can do it any time. And so, um, it, it really is, you know, what a what a gift it is to to have the urgency and to value time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. How often were you injured in your training along the way? Man, I was so lucky. You know, I w- I was very very lucky. I had little tweaks, but I never had like massive, massive injuries until just the last few years. What do you so, consider massive, massive? Well, where you have to, scale shift on this one quite substantially. Yeah, well, <laughs> so where, where I have to have surgery. Okay. Right, a surgery. So surgery-wise, um, I've had two meniscus surgeries, one on my right, one on my left, which is not massive by in, in most people's scales. Yeah. Um, I've had a back, low back injury, um, and it was probably a, a combination of training, but it didn't happen during training. It happened when I was actually doing like sprints upstairs. Um, so, but that all happened just the last few years and then stuff going on with my shoulders. I've had some shoulder stuff. Um, and I, it's probably just from years and years of wear and tear. And I think one of the things people don't realize when you're doing jujitsu all the time, how much we rotate our shoulders in, how we're always kind of forward rotation on the shoulders and we're always kind of defending and keeping our arms in tight. So we have all this forward. So it's taught me a lot about my body and taught me, you know, how to kind of rehab myself. So, um, but you were able to escape that progression without any massive catastrophic injuries along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I barely have cauliflower ear, which is crazy. And I don't train with headgear. Yeah. So um, I, you know, even though we were we were going to war a lot, I think coming from Hickson's, we were also there was such a huge emphasis on technique and being technical. Um, you know, that was a huge thing that he always emphasized and tried to beat in our heads is is things have to feel effortless and soft, and if they're not, then you're doing it wrong and come ask me and I'll show you like, you know, if it feels like you're using too much strength. And, and so, um, that was a huge thing is just learning to be smooth and learning not to resist and fight, learning not to be stiff. So a lot of that's, you know, I was, I was talking to Rob Wolf. You've had yeah, Rob. Rob. Wolf. So, um, I was talking to Rob one day and I was telling him, I said, yeah, that's, I think that is a, a major contributor to a lot of the injuries in jujitsu is anytime someone s- s- tightens up, s- yeah. you know, squeeze their muscles what happens is they've completely lost all of their mobility so no matter how much you stretch no matter how flexible you are as soon as you tense up all the muscles as soon as you lock this limb into place if someone rips your arm because all everything is tightened and and shortened up now you don't have them so if i tighten my arm like this and someone rips my arm oh yeah it's going that's my shoulder when normal my normal range of motion is i can move my arm all the way here and so i think that's a huge thing for people to learn in jiu-jitsu is and what's so funny is instructors from day one try to beat it into students heads learn to relax learn to relax learn to relax but for most of us we don't experience it that much in jiu-jitsu like you slap hands with someone and initially when most people start training all the panic it feels like you're it almost feels like you're in a fight Mm -hmm. right people get that that and they tense up and so that's a huge thing that happens over time with jiu-jitsu is learning to deal with that um that anxiety and, and learning to relax through it and just make yourself calm through it. Yeah, that makes sense. The difference between like trying to bend a long stick that's been dried out and rigid versus a green stick and you can just touch the ends with it. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. So that that's I think that's a huge thing. And obviously tapping is helpful, knowing when to tap. I mean, you know, myself included, I was a knucklehead when I was younger and I've had, you know, my elbows pop, like my elbows still pop. Um, from having them, you know, 
extended, just not wanting to give up when I know I should. And, you know, that's that's the beautiful thing with jujitsu is we all have a tool to be able to protect ourselves, right? And that's tapping. Yeah. So anytime I get caught in any situation where, you know, I mean, what's more important for me is that I come back tomorrow and train. For sure. Right. So um, just learning when to tap and knowing that I have that tool at any given time, anything time things get too uncomfortable or too, that I can tap and start again. Yeah. Gentlemen, what do you have? I have asked every single question. You guys are just sitting here drinking beer. It's unbelievable. <laughs> we've been on before. This is Henry's podcast. I know. Yeah, we've... I was actually doing what you were doing, which was learning. Same. I fuck. Yeah. I mean, at this point, like with the level of knowledge in this room, I'm like, I actually don't even know the right questions to ask. I mean, you guys have a such a different no, no, no optic I, I, on it. I'm in third place, so I'm 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 closer to you than I am to these guys. That's actually not true from a mathematical I think, I think perspective. I think Henry just but... explained that though. <laughs> like, I mean, there are levels to black belt, like. These guys have have been black belts for much longer than I have, and um, no, I look. I'm super excited to have Henry here, and um, you know, having part part of SBG is just, you know, yeah, it's that killer. was that was, yeah. yeah. When when he when when he said that, I was just like, man, perfect fit. Like his style of teaching and the way he thinks about jujitsu is exactly in well, line. Well, that's with the thing. Yeah, it just our philosophy about yeah. martial arts and besides training methodologies it's it's understanding how to train effectively and f having the right mindset for training you know yeah being smart with training and, and and keeping it realistic and understanding that first and foremost it's a martial art and this is for combat you know um well, Keith is going to kill us if we go much longer so the number one question i always get which i'm not qualified to answer is what do you recommend for people when they're first starting? Reasonable expectation that they could set for themselves. Or I should say in, in an expectation they should set in a mindset that they should go in with. So for me, I always focus on the fundamentals. Um, one of the things I'm really big on teaching is the concepts and ideas. So I always, understanding the concepts and ideas behind jujitsu and then explaining that through the technique so um, for example the mount position this is what you're trying to achieve so when you're in the mount you know your job is to maintain the position and then you know go for submission and these are the different things these are the different ways you can go for submission so i think that is really really huge because understanding what you should be doing like okay these are the positions when you first start training these are pos the positions you want to get to you know you want to be on top and if you're on top, you yeah, want to be good luck with that. cross-eyed. <laughs> when or, you first start. Right. <laughs> Let me but tell you a fairy you know. tale about where you'll be later on. This is called Mount Top. You will be on the opposite of that position <laughs> right. in this journey. But at least you know you want to fight for that position, <laughs> yeah. right? You want to fight yeah. for the top position. If you end up on the bottom, this is where you want to be. If you end up on the bottom, you want to be have the person in between your legs so that you have more control of them, right? Um, and then just kind of go from there. So I think understanding the the fundamentals uh concepts behind what you're trying to achieve you know is so important for jiu-jitsu understanding why jiu-jitsu is effective well these are the positions like you know we'll, we'll talk about it this weekend in these positions when i'm mounted on someone it's very difficult for them to be effective with strikes so i put myself in a position where i'm safe from taking damage but i can inflict damage on someone or when i'm cross-sided you know you have a, you're going to have a very difficult time hurting me with any type of headbutts or elbows yeah. or knees, but I could do that to you. And then I also have submissions. And so really kind of breaking that down for the students so that they understand like, okay, these, this is what I'm trying to achieve. And then you teach them the techniques by which they're going to go about achieving that. Right. And you just, that's awesome. Just to add one thing, you're super humble. And you're talking about you coming in for the last two years, but rolling with a bunch of like purple belts and brown belts and black belts. But the other thing you have to remember, because some people listening to this podcast will be like, I want to try jujitsu, but Andy's telling me I have to get beat up for 10 years. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying Mount Top might no, be no, a but, fucking okay, concept. Correct. For a bit. No, correct. But no, but, but <laughs> well, listen, if you disagree with me, disagree with me. But until the day, even after three months of training, that you clinch with someone who hasn't done jujitsu and then you can mount them and stay there forever. I would right. agree. You know, so like you don't want to always be like, I'm a white belt, but I couldn't do anything to a purple belt. Of course you couldn't. 
But to some uninitiated civilian, you can play with them after like two months of jujitsu. Well, that was my sure, experience, and I wouldn't right? compare that. Right. I would four months. Fujo. Four months, yeah. And I would tell people, don't compare yourself to the purple belt. Think about how you would treat your, be with yourself the day before. That's and, the, the yeah, measuring stick exactly. that, that you should that, use. Yes. Yeah. That's, a good, that's not, a good point. It, 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 you should never compare yourself to other people in jujitsu. Right. Right. It should only ever be, how would I do against myself six months ago? Yeah. So could, could the current me be the former me? So I had a couple guys at my uh, my house in Vegas um, last week that came out from Kentucky to train. One of the guys was an attorney. He had been training for six months. And he was sharing with me on the mat. He's like, yeah, man, I have this thing with my older brother. <laughs> this guy's 40, and he's got an older brother that he said is a beast that used to play football. And every time we hang out, we start wrestling. Okay. Weird. He said this is the first time he started learning jiu-jitsu just a few months ago. He was actually able to dominate his older, bigger brother. And he goes, yeah, he was like, the last time we wrestled, I submitted him. So that to me is pretty, that, I mean, that's, you know, and this guy, you know, of course I'm rolling around with him and the guy's a big dude. He's probably six foot three, 260, you know, and I'm tossing around, but he was like, that's my measuring stick. Like I, I used to have a hard time with my older brother. My older brother would just, you know, wrestle, we would wrestle each other and he would just, you know, dominate me. And he goes like, yeah, now I'm submitting my older brother. Elk season 2018, <laughs> alcohol involved in this, by the way, with Dudley campfire. There's a dude from Bozeman. He's at least six, four, two, 30 to 40. How long have you been training at this point? <laughs> Two, three months, maybe. I was still in foundations. <laughs> and he's talking shit. He's like, that shit doesn't work. And, he, and he's like, I'm going to tackle you. And we're seated. And he puts his beer down. And I was like, okay. And I triangled his fucking face off. <laughs> Dude, just some words. We always come. No. We right always. Right by the fire. But like, I was, he came at me and I threw him in a closed guard. He didn't know how to get out of it. He had a big puffy jacket with a zipper, so I was actually just sawing that across his neck for a little bit for my own personal pleasure. <laughs> but stuffed an arm, got a leg over, and he was just like, what in the actual fuck? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, we're always comparing <laughs> ourselves to other like <laughs> professional jiu-jitsu dudes, but against yeah. guys who don't know, you can just play with cool them. And that's the cool thing yeah. is it's, it's been tested and tested. That's the amazing thing with jiu-jitsu yeah. is when you train and when you roll, you're you're testing it against a hundred percent resistance, and that you can do it in a in a safe way where and you're not against somebody to who knows the rules and the skill as well. It's right. There's been only a f like Dudley. Actually, shit, we were in Salt Lake a year, and maybe a year after this, I'd been in, at it a year, and we were just fucking around. and We had done a workout. He's like, I've never done a CrossFit workout. I'm like, Oh, come here. <laughs> this is a rowing machine. This is a stand up rowing machine. These are thrusters. And here's, we're gonna put here's some the toilet. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so he was just gassed already. Then there were some mats. He's like, Hey, man, teach me some jiu-jitsu. I'm like, Listen, dude, I don't actually know anything that I can teach you. But we just messed around and it was, I hear people call it a superpower. I'm like, it's not that, but it's an amazing set of skills. And if you know 3% more yeah. than the person or if they've never touched it, it doesn't make sense. The angles and the leverage and how you can just, well, you can, they can come at you and they're just bouncing off like a bullet hitting a, you know, that angled side of a wall. Yeah. The yeah. ability to play with someone that's twice your size and twice your strength and effortlessly and, and submit them at will is a pretty pretty amazing yeah. skill set. Did you break his throat? I did not break his throat. <laughs> You'd have to be really a lot better than he was to actually hurt him, right? Because then you <laughs> then you could control yourself. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That was, that, like I said, you'll hear him in his podcast. Be like, <clears throat> <clears throat> okay. <laughs> courtesy of Andy. No. no oh no no different no. story. That was oh. courtesy of Jocko. <laughs> oh. Oh yeah, it's gentle Jocko. Yeah. Um, I'll roll with him one day, but I'm going to attack him in the fucking parking garage with a lead pipe. <laughs> <laughs> now it's, uh, fuck. Thank you for taking the time. If we literally a so probably will kill us. So we don't go to yeah, dinner absolutely. at some point here. Yeah. Anybody well, wants any of my jujitsu yes, knowledge? Where can people find you? Uh, hidden jujitsu. So I have a website. Oh, real good job. Hide your fucking jujitsu. Jiu That's really going to help people find it. So people can't see it. Hiddenjujitsu.com. Um, yeah, hiddenjujitsu.com. So How about that's where uh, I have all the information? Social media handles. Um, Facebook. Uh, man, I got to get better at Instagram. I, I it's a weird suck ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, what's Henry your name Akins though BJJ on, Instagram. on Instagram? Is it Henry Akins? Henry Akins BJJ. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough, gentlemen. I think to. Uh, you I would. Close? I would just say that I've been doing this for a long time, and um, I'm all. I always try to see Henry as often as possible to get like the last 5% or the last 10% from feeling it. 
But I will say, if anyone checks out Hidden Jiu-Jitsu, it's not hidden. It's I can get 90 on a bad, bad, bad day, 85%. Good, good day, 95% of what he's doing from the videos. And then you hook up and fill in the blanks. But it's it's great material. Yeah, I, I tag on that too. Just yeah. like the, the videos are great. Um, but if you get a chance to train with them in person, it's a game changer. Do I need to teach you how to talk into that? It's cylindrical and black. It should be like red. I was talking into it, wasn't right? I? It, it, so I was talking into it. <laughs> He's a in, inveterate. Open real wide. Hey, Travis eats pho. He I, does. I do eat a lot of pho. Was that some pho? of the best pho you've had? I'm sure. <laughs> hey, Frank, I fucking fell out of a seat yesterday. Are you going to do the uh, camps again once the world actually comes back to some yeah, sense of absolutely. not Oh, is that going to happen? Mind? Normal? What? I don't actually know the answer to that is the problem. It will post-November. It's possible. You t- talk about the camps a little bit because I watched from a distance, and by that I mean Facebook, when you guys were in Thailand. And it was I, awesome. I've already, like, the money is put aside. Like, I'm coming to the – wherever you do them, I'm coming. Yeah, for sure. the camps are awesome. They're amazing. So what we do is um, we pick an exotic destination. Uh, we have people from all over the world come and train with me for a week, and we usually do three to four hours a day. So enough time where people get – we, we get to go really in depth yeah. on different topics of jiu-jitsu but there's also enough time to like hang out and make friends and build relationships and go out and have dinners and you know go have fun so you know um and like i said that's one of the most amazing things i feel about jiu-jitsu is all of the people that you get to meet um i've met so many amazing cool people and so just having being able to have friends all over the world so that's really what that experience is about is getting to go on vacation, getting to do something you're passionate about and getting to hang out with amazing people. Do you post those on the hidden jujitsu.com? Yeah, it's on, okay. it's on hidden jujitsu and hidden. Jiu- I think, uh, the link to that is there's a separate link hidden jujitsu camps. The next time I see you post one or le- just shoot me a text when you're going to put one up and I'll okay. p- promote it for sure. Because I yeah. was extremely jealous. Of it was the- awesome. Fuck. It was just I- that I was like, the scenery, and I wasn't even really looking at the pictures. I was like, holy shit, you guys are doing stuff in an awesome location. Yeah. Yeah. Keith and I had already agreed that that was going to be our next yeah. trip. Yep. So I'm I was for pretty sure. bummed. Well, on that note, first, we should probably start with dinner. Cool. All right, gentlemen. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, guys. Peace.